You're listening to the Fringianity Underground Podcast. Fringe topics with a Christian point of view. Now here's your host, Leo Rutledge. Today's episode is on Halloween and its occult ties to satanic occult ritual abuse crimes and all kinds of stuff that happens around the season or the holiday of Halloween. This episode has some pretty dark content or very adult content so please I just don't want any kids listening to this episode because of the things that are talked about in some of the clips on this episode. So please if you have kids I pray that you won't let them hear this because it's pretty dark and gruesome even. So with that, let's begin the show. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. While there are some people who may be concerned about the origins of Halloween and its focus on blood, death, horror, and the occult, to millions of youngsters across the nation, it has been adopted as a time to pursue scary fun. It is an opportunity to dress up in ghoulish or fanciful costumes, to engage in the fantasy of being a witch or a vampire, ghost or devil. Eager trick-or-treaters solicit candy door-to-door or bob for apples at Halloween parties. Others brave haunted houses and horror movie marathons while the more daring visit cemeteries at midnight, play with Ouija boards, and hold seances in an effort to contact spirits of the dead. What you commonly call Halloween, in the occult world they call it Samhain. Now, when you look at the name, it looks as if it's saying Samhain or something like that. No, 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 no. This is properly pronounced in the ancient Gaelic as Samhain. Samhain, according to occult tradition, was the Lord of the Dead. Now, around 900 BC, a very fierce nomadic people came into the areas of what used to be known as Gaul, Saxony, Brittany, we know it now as the British Isle, and of course it eventually went to Scotland Island and the rest of the surrounding areas. These people were known as the Celts. Now, the Celtic people, they were so fierce and so barbaric that twice they held off the famous um, Roman legion and extracted heavy tribute from Rome itself. They literally held all power from 900 BC to approximately 900 AD in that area. The Celtic Lord of the Dead, Samhain, is just another name, Samhain, for Nimrod. You study all the myths all the occult myths of Samhain, he is also a stag god. He has horns just like the um, stag god of the occult world that is so constant. But this particular time of the year, October 29th through the 31st, these, those three days constitute what's known as Samhain. Everyone thinks Halloween is just a one-night thing. October 31st, but it is not. See, in the occult world, this is a three-day fire festival. It lasts from the 29th through the 31st. During the time when the Druid priest 
held power in Great Britain. Now, the Druids held all power. You couldn't get married without their, with their, with, yeah, without their permission. You couldn't hold any type of official title in the clan without their permission. You couldn't even attend any of their religious ceremonies without their permission. They literally held power over all life and death, and you're really going to find out how in this example. During the Knights of Samhain, the Druids would gather at these giant megalithic stone circles. One of the most common known stone circle is, of course, Stonehenge. Just about everyone has seen Stonehenge at one time or another, be it in picture or if they were actually there. Now, Stonehenge, as I said, it's a megalithic crop circle. Uh, yeah, megalithic crop circle. That's the UFOs. Wrong subject. But we could always get there. <laughs> this is a megalithic stone circle. It served three specific functions. First of all, it was a temple complex. Second of all, it served as an astrological observatory. Third, it served as a place of human sacrifice. Archaeologists have already unearthed underneath Stonehenge, over 4,000 human skeletal remains. And that's just Stonehenge. There are hundreds of these throughout the British Isles. This one, believe it or not, is small compared to some of the others. The one in Aysbury is over a mile in circumference. This is just a small one. And there's over 4,000 um, dead human sacrifices underneath it. You multiply that by X amount of hundreds of these stone circles, and I think you'll understand what the Druids were all about and why they were so greatly feared by the common folk. During the time of Samhain, the Druids, in this example, they would meet at Stonehenge. They had a giant cauldron, a black pot, that they would fill with what you would best understand as an apple cider-like substance. They would light the pot, and then all the Druid priests would go out throughout the countryside. They would go to um, various mansions, to castles, to people of nobility such as the earls, marquis, dukes, what have you. They would walk up to the front door of these places, and you want to know what they would yell out? Trick or treat, exactly. Now, see, trick or treat is a two-part expression that literally sent waves and waves and waves of panic throughout the people who ever heard it. You see, if the Lord of the Manor cooperated with the um, Druids, he would take one of his own servants or one of his own household members, someone of his own family, and pass them over to the Druids to be used as a human sacrifice offering that night. The Druids would leave you a treat for your cooperation. They would take a pumpkin that was previously hollowed out and filled with human fat. They would leave it on the front doorstep and light it. This served as a water protection from all the demonic forces that would be unleashed that night. Now this is where we get into the trick. If you did not cooperate with the Druids, they would take blood from a dead um, body that they had actually been dragging around and paint the six-pointed star with a circle around it. This is known as a hexagram from the Latin hexer for six. This is the foulest, the most evil of all the symbols in the occult world. I don't care what anyone else tells you. You need that symbol if you're going to summon a demon to this plane of existence. The Druids would paint that in human blood on the people's front door, someone would die between those nights because of the demonic forces that were summoned. Four or five hours later, the Druids would all return in this example, as I stated, back to Stonehenge. Once they got back to Stonehenge, they would take these people and put them in these cages. One particular cage is a um, great interest. They would take those wicker reeds. Remember how we had talked about those before, how the Easter egg landed in wicker? And it's a very, very durable material. 
what the Druids would do a week before Saul began, they would send the Celtic um, warriors out throughout the countryside where they would gather up thousands of these wicker reeds. Once they brought them back, they formed a giant wicker man. The wicker man looked something similar to this. It stood approximately 25 to 30 feet in height and was just intercrossing wicker reed to where it formed the effigy of a human man. This would usually be two to three levels in height and have cages running throughout it. The Druids, once they brought back all the, pee, all the human sacrifice offerings from trick-or-treating, they would throw them into those cages and tie them. Now, if by some chance they ran out of space in the wicker man, they had these regular square cages made out of wicker that they had set aside just in case. Now, this is where the Druids now would have their version of fun. They would take approximately 12 prisoners, 12 people now, who were going to be used as human sacrifice offerings, and line them up in a single row in front of that cauldron. They would take an apple, throw it into the cauldron, and say, if you can take that in between your teeth on the first try, you will be set free immediately. Who would do that? Raise your hand. Who would try to grab that apple in between their teeth so that they could be set free? Who would do it? Raise your hand, please. There's only one problem, though. That cauldron has been boiling away for four to five hours now. The boiling temperature of liquid is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, who would do it? No volunteers? You? You know you'd be the only one then who would, chance, who would have a chance of living. You see, if you didn't try for it, you were going to end up as a human sacrifice offering anyways. This was your only way out. Every single person there did take the chance, except with dire consequences, let's face it. After they plunged their heads into that boiling liquid, their faces, their neck, and I don't even know how much of their um, chest and back, literally was just melting to where they would be permanently disfigured and unrecognizable. Many of them went blind because of the 212 degree liquid that was burning their eye sockets away. Many end up as partially or permanently deaf because of the damage that was done to their ear canal. And the damage that was done to their speech and to their respiratory system because all that liquid was funneling down their throats while they were trying to grab that apple. And yes, this is where you've got that cutesy little game bobbing for apples. Now, if you did grab that apple on the first try in between your teeth, they held to their promise. They let you go some life afterwards. But if you didn't do it, they would throw you on the ground and behead you right there on the spot. Samhain is the highest night of human sacrifice on the Illuminati's calendar. And the reason it is, is because this is at this time of the year, what's known as a crossroad. It ends the old year and begins the new one. Now, all crossroads in the occult are sacred. Um, another example would be where the beach begins and uh, where the beach ends and the ocean begins. That's a crossroad. That's considered a sacred spot. All crossroads are sacred. Now, during this time of the year, it is believed that those souls that had, over, that had died from who knows how long ago because the um, veil that separating the third and fourth dimension are supposed to be at their thinnest, those departed souls can cross over and visit their loved ones for the night. But nothing guaranteed that these spirits would be um, benevolent. In order to keep these spirits in line, the Druids came up with these hideous masks and decorated their robes with all types of occult symbols to control these demonic spirits, if you would. And you know, this is where you get your um, costumes for trick-or-treating from. Let's face it, it comes straight with the mask and the outfit to this very day. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. 
there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or that useth divinations, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. That's the Bible when it talks about occult stuff, witchcraft, wizards, seeking to communicate with your dead relatives using Ouija board, per se. Stuff like that. That's how God feels about that. Now, when you think of Halloween, what do you think of? Do you think of a Christian thing? Anything that would be righteous, in the light, done before God, proudly? Or is it done in the dark, done in secret, hidden behind a mask, dressed up as a witch, dressed up as a vampire, dressed up as dead things? How many yards do you see with dead things in it? Skulls, pumpkins with demon faces, and just generally occult-looking stuff. How many parties do you hear people going to, to get drunk, high, or whatever, and it's just a heathen event for happy, you know, just to have fun and just go out and, you know, let it go, man, you know. And how many, how many people dress up in scantily clad clothing? How many women dress up as sexy nurses, sexy witches, sexy this, that, and the other thing? Everything is sexy. How many little girls are dressed in sexualized costumes? Even aside from that, how many children are dressed as a witch? Uh... Harry Potter, all kinds of stuff like that. Is that not considered the same as there shall not be found among you a witch, a wizard, a sorcerer, a necromancer? I mean, these things you're dressing the, your kids up as. Now, here's the thing. If you're a Christian, you should be really rethinking your, your whole thought process here because if you're letting your kids dress up as witches and wizards and Harry Potter or stuff like that, uh, it's, it's kind of insane that you're not connecting the dots here, that your own Bible says that there shall not be found among you, talking about the Christians, anyone that does these things or even tries to look like these things. What business does light have with darkness? So in other words, what business does a Christian have to do with being a pagan or acting like the world and trying to do as the world does, and dressing up like a witch, a wizard, a zombie, anything that's undead, or whatever, this type of stuff. Or even as celebrities, their, their thought process is bankrupt. These are things I just want Christians to think about. And a lot of Christians like to take their kids to uh, their church on Halloween. I know there are a whole lot of them that I have seen that have done trunk or treat. Does that sound familiar? I bet you a lot of your churches out there are doing trunk or treat this year. Instead of going out and doing it, they're just going to go to your go to the church and everyone's going to stop by everyone's trunks. But they're still going to be dressed up. They're still going to be doing all the things that the pagan people once did. So you're still copying the world. Well, you're copying pagans. The, the Catholics at one point tried to get rid of this by taking and saying that it's All Saints Day and all this stuff. And that's fine and everything. Or, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to take it away from the paganism. Which, that's, that's a good idea. But then, all the paganism uh, rituals and like dressing up with masks and doing all the bobbing for apples all came with it. So then you mingled Christianity with paganism even then. So nothing changed really. Of course, you're not sacrificing children, but still you're doing the pagan thing, even though you Christianized it. You just wrapped it up in a Christian bow, but you're still doing the thing that is pagan. And I'm sure some of you will disagree with me heavily and say, well, you're not supposed to condemn Christians for, for that because it's up to them to decide. And it is up to you to decide. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm presenting you with evidence that shows that the this whole holiday 
and the things that it celebrates are of death and destruction. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, a skeleton hanging in your yard with a noose around its neck is not exactly uh, a godly thing. And also, isn't fear something that is not of the Lord? So being scared on a holiday, a holiday all invested in, ho- in fear and scariness, isn't that not of the Lord? In, in its very essence, that's not Christian. That's not, that's not what Jesus would be about. And when Jesus comes back, do you think that Halloween will be a holiday that he celebrates? I highly doubt that. So these are some things to just think about, okay? I'm not telling you how to do what you're doing. I'm not telling you how to celebrate anything. I'm not telling you whether or whether or not you should celebrate Halloween. I'm just giving you facts here, okay? I know this upsets a lot of people, but I'm just presenting the facts. Now, things are going to get a lot darker once I move forward on this now because I'm going to take a look at uh, satanic ritual abuse and occult crimes that happen around the holiday of Halloween. And you're going to hear actual testimonies from people who were raised in the Illuminati or, you know, elite groups of Satanism. I'll just put it that way that did terrible things or were taught terrible things or had terrible things done to them around this holiday. Because let's just face it, the Satanists love this holiday. They love it. So it's not nothing new that the darkness is celebrated by the enemy of Christ. And the enemy of Christ literally mocks and laughs at Christians for celebrating this holiday. Anton LaVey, the head of the Church of Satan, at one point was quoted saying, I'm glad Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year when he's talking about Halloween. Now, I don't think you're worshiping the devil by going out for Halloween. That's a bit far. But he's mocking you because you're out doing something that is pagan. So let's think about that. And also Halloween, according to um, that little clip that I just played, he was talking about Halloween is a celebration to try to appease the spirit of death. Well, my God is a spirit of life, not death. So therefore, that right there alone should tell you that this is not something for Christians. Don't honor pagan practices if you serve Jesus, because you don't need to. You're free of that. You should be free of that. You should be celebrating Jesus, not any kind of spirit of death or destruction or darkness, or anything like that. So now I'm going to play a clip. It really talks about the Illuminati, or whatever, elite groups in government, high places, whatever, that are all part of a system that is satanically abusing people, ritually abusing them, and their children, and all this, and they're raised up in these terrible, horrible, satanic families. And some of their stories have come out. So listen to these horrible torturous testimonies of these poor people. Halloween seems to be the high holy day for the Satanist and the occultist. Halloween is the time when all across the country, in secret little places, in the dark, there will be little babies sacrificed to Satan. A child, when it is first born, is innocent and pure. It's untouched, it's unspoiled. Nothing bad has ever entered that child. That child's thoughts are pure. So they sacrifice that to the devil as the child being pure because all things pure are feared by Satanists and also by the devil. So if you've got something pure and you destroy it, you take away the purity and there's no longer a threat there. I remember just constant, absolute terror, and I can't explain how intense, how strong, how all-encompassing that terror is. Unless you do this, you're going to get killed. You're going to die. They made it to be like it was a great privilege to eat the bodies. I mean, the, the girl that I had to kill, they treated me like I was being given a great gift when they gave me a part of her body that I had to eat. I remember being horrified, but knowing that 
my horror would not let me survive and that I had to put my horror somewhere else. There's certainly bankers, there are certainly psychologists, there are certainly uh, people in media. We hear a lot about Department of Children's Services workers, we hear a lot about police officers. The cult has reason to have their people in virtually every walk of life feel that the ritual abuse of children is at bottom an attempt to develop human resources for the cult, develop children who have had so much abuse and so much mind control um, to which they've been subjected, that they will be maximally beneficial to the cult in a whole variety of areas. But with what possible aim? I think their aim is really to have as much control of, you know, of this country and of other countries as they can possibly get. It is entirely possible that this is, beyond the mafia and any other organized criminal activity, the largest network of evil and organized criminal functioning that exists in the world. They intend to infiltrate the justice system, legislative and executive branches of government, positions of power and authority and the professions so that they can take over. After all, they do believe, as the Bible prophesies, that someday their ruler, the Antichrist, will control the entire world. Glenn, could you tell us about your involvement in any rituals at Halloween as a child? There was a, another little girl that was involved in the, uh, the occult with me, and her name was Becky. Now, Becky was another, a different type of child. She was uh, blessed to be a sacrifice. I was being blessed to be a high priest, where she was being blessed and born into the, the coven there to be a sacrifice. Now, we were in a ritual where we were married together. Um, it was a marriage to the beast. And uh, me and the little girl were married together, and there was a lot of sexual abuse that took place, and a, a lot of blood that was spilt over us, joining us together. When do Halloween rituals actually begin, and what is the ultimate purpose of Halloween? Well, the ritual that I remember the most clearly um, began about the end of September. Um, me and the little girl, the one I mentioned named Becky, the, the abuse was very concentrated at that time. Uh, we were taken into several rooms where our clothing was removed. We spent the next couple of weeks in a kind of a shack where a lot of rituals went on, where a lot of animals were, were killed. Um, they summoned Lucifer and his spirit to come and uh, possess me and so that I would be blessed to take over the position of the high priest at a certain point in time. Um, now, Halloween night, um, they had again put me and the little girl in the, in the back of this van. And we again drove off, which seemed like for a long time. We were drugged once again. And we finally came to this stop. They took the little girl out and they left me in the van. Um, I could hear a lot of commotion that was going on outside. Uh, people that were, were screaming and, and yelling and, and uh, this low murmuring and a moaning noise that was going on, like some kind of a low chanting noise that was going on. So I knew in my mind there was some type of a ritual going on because I'd heard that many times before. You know, it was real common to see people fall on the ground and and convulse and, and go into convulsions during rituals and stuff with the demonic presence that were around. And uh, finally, a woman came to the back of the van and she said, it's time to go. And she brought me out of the van and I could see that there was just a lot of people around. Uh, some were dressed in uh, dark brownish kind of robes with hoods over them. They took me up and they led me up to this stone altar and uh, I remember I saw the little girl and she was on the altar now at first you know I, I just wondered what was going on because you never knew I mean they used the altar for a lot of different things they could have just been sacrificing an animal over could have been a sexual abuse from the high priest on to her you know it was a hard thing to to know for sure well they finally they ushered me up to the altar 
and I could see that they had bound her feet. They had, they had her feet spread apart, her legs, and they had bound them to the ends of the altar, and they had taken her arms, which were laying out this way, and roped them to the altar, which had little kind of like hooks, which they could bind the ropes around. And she was really white. Just I, I, I remember seeing her, and she was just real pale and real white. And I noticed that they had slit the bottoms of her feet and her wrists. And they were taking the blood that was running out of those areas and putting them into chalices and passing those cups around to different people who were partaking of her blood. Then the, the high priest, he took the athami or the ritual knife and he picked it up and he put my hand on it and then he forced it into her chest. So when I think back on Halloween, you know, over that period of time that happened, you know, that was the climax event, Halloween night, where they, they killed that innocent little girl. And this is something that's happening every Halloween. Uh, they're dancing with the demons tonight and tomorrow night. The ritual calendar, human sacrifice, sexual yeah. sacrifice, children uh, from 7 to 17, yeah. all the way to November 4th. So it's not just going to end tonight or tomorrow, all the way to November 4th. So it's many days. This is like the ramp up day, so to say. And there is uh, blood rituals and, and, as you know, unfortunately, human sacrifices. Absolutely. Well, that's what it's, that's what, even their calendar, anybody can look at the calendar on the web, and that just gives basic information. But from the 13th to the 30th, it's abduction. They've got to, they got to find the, the ones that they're going to use uh, and hold them. Yeah. And uh, then the human sacrifice tonight, tomorrow, uh, even Monday night, uh, blood sacrifices, but the fourth on uh, Satanic Rebels is another night to, to kind of conclude all of this. Yeah. And that will involve human sacrifice too. That's just sick that they can get away. And, and unfortunately, there is higher realms in the government that is under this uh, archy uh, also, Russ, as you know. Uh, sure. So there's protection for a lot of these covets. And well, protection and uh, the hiding places are off the scale, the underground stuff. You know, when we talk about the infiltration of government, uh, military, law enforcement, all segments... Now that all began back in the 50s. Right. It is so it is so deep and so wide right now that yeah, uh, I was mentioning on another broadcast about um, going back to the cold cases, the Finders, the uh, Franklin uh, uh, cover-up cases, McMartin. Yeah. Uh, those are some things. The Presidio with Colonel Aquino, uh, and then again, here's the big thing: you and I, we're in the USA. Uh, Europe's the belly of the beast. There's more victims there. And the deeper uh, kind of cone of power, which that's Europe. Uh, even Russia has hundreds of thousands of these same kind of victims. And we're talking about the worst of the worst. Uh, that's not even counting, you know, again, witches and upper level Satanists, you know, the lighter level stuff uh, that are all going to be drawing powers. Drawing their powers from Satan, of course, because that's where they get their power from. All of these occult groups, all these Illuminati groups, all of these Freemasonry groups, all these sick and twisted societies that are behind closed doors that really keep them keep uh, the world at bay through secrets and secret handshakes and secret occult everything, just secrets in general. All of this stuff, it's even in the Vatican. I don't care what anyone tells me. The Vatican, I'm sure if you go down underneath the Vatican in its deepest places, you're going to find child sacrifices, child molestation, uh, pedophile cases, every kind of thing that you can imagine. Because, I mean, Luciferians are definitely in the Vatican. Look at the symbols, just the symbols alone that you'll find. Just looking at pictures, just Google the Vatican uh, Illuminati symbols. Just Google it and you'll find literally just 
straight up pictures of pyramids with the eye of Horus. Uh, you'll see uh, Dagon hats, which I've mentioned before on this show. Uh, you'll see all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's it's really sickening. And, and people just don't get it. The word Catholic means universal. That means a universal religion. A religion that universally... In other words, it's it's all encompassing. They they take in the pagans and all the other things, and they just compass it under one umbrella to tell you that we all worship the same God. And if you don't believe me, then listen to the Pope. The Pope recently, well, I shouldn't say recently, many many times has talked about how we worship all of us, all these different religions worship the same God. So. If we all worship the same God, then that's 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 that that's backward because it says straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So if all the religions believe in the the real God and they're all going to heaven, then who is going to hell here? I mean, let's just look at it that way. Who's going to hell? Because the Bible specifically talks about people who they will end up in the lake of fire and there's a lot of people but if you go by the vatican it sounds to me like that oh everyone's going to heaven so which is it i tend to believe my bible over the vatican or any man who tells me otherwise i like to research it in my bible because believe it or not um your soul is kind of a big deal where you spend eternity is a very big deal. Now, I'm not trying to get into this. I'm not trying to curve this show to be all about Vatican. But I'm just saying that the highest and highest societies, governments, whatever, have these people who worship Lucifer in it at the top. And they're all about power. So it makes sense that they would be in government or in leadership positions. It makes perfect sense. So the thing is, I'm just telling you to be safe. Be careful. Because on holidays like Halloween, these there are groups out there that are looking for people to sacrifice. Children are the number one thing that they want to sacrifice. Children are innocent. They're pure. They're the perfect thing for Satanists to want to sacrifice because of their innocence. Because it literally goes against everything that Jesus said. Matthew 18, 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So think about that. And he's not talking about scolding your child. He's talking about a person who's like a pedophile or something, someone who literally has a has an agenda, an evil agenda to use a child for. Because a child is so innocent. A child is pure and good, you know? I mean, I understand some child's are, children are brats, but they're good. I mean, these are kids. Whoever doesn't defend a child is worthless. So think about that. So I'm doing my part in defending children because that's who, uh, for the most part, Halloween is for. Even though in America, it's the it's only second to Christmas in being the number one highest grossing ho- holiday. So there, that means adults are celebrating it too. But it makes perfect sense since America is going pagan. After all, America has turned from its somewhat Christian roots... And turned more um, anything goes, and I mean we're putting, we're put, we're taking down Ten Commandments and putting up Bathomit for crying out loud, Baal, Baal monuments and stuff like that. It's just ridiculous. I mean, and it's no surprise. I mean, child sacrifice is one of the number one killers in our country. Yeah, it's called abortion. It's called child sacrifice, as far as I'm concerned, but it's called. Abortion, according to the government, that makes this legal. So, the blood of the the saints, 
literally, because these children are innocent and they are something important to God, is literally being shed. And that is a horrible thing. And at this time of year, like around Halloween or whatever, you've already heard the audio clips I played with all these people talking about how these groups are out there collecting people and they're taking them as sacrifices and doing all these terrible things. And even just put all that aside. How many children could be found on the street to just be raped and whatever, used in some twisted psycho, psycho way? So I'm just saying, please think twice, be careful at this time of year, and also use this holiday. If you're a Christian, I say stay home. And literally, if they come to your door and say trick or treat, pass out Bible scriptures and some, some candy, and quality candy, not just crap, you know. And, you know, be, be a Christian, you know. Show good goodwill toward these people, even. I'm not saying tell them, oh, blah, blah, I hate you because you're celebrating Halloween. No. Give them, the option is there to get the word out about Jesus. So use that. So I'm not condemning you. I'm not telling you, oh, you're all going to hell because of uh, Halloween and all that. Okay? I'm leaving it up to you. You're, I'm sure the people who are listening to this podcast specifically are adults. I'm sure you can make decisions for yourself. At least I hope so. <laughs> but the point of this one is I really felt the Lord pressing me to at least talk about some of these things that other people probably don't talk about. So that's about all I have. I hope that you'll at least think about some of this stuff. So with that, thank you for listening.